Welcome to the 2012 Freedom of Expression Forum. Today we have Joel Matheson, Assistant Professor of Journalism in Middle School, Northwestern University. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Today, uh, your, the topic of your discussion today was the failings of the American Free Press. And to start on that team, my friend would like to ask several questions to you. Okay. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, the title of the lecture mentions forfeiture of freedom of expression. Um, would you say that this is, a, or agree that this is a rather cynical notion? And um, like, do you think there are any rays of hope for freedom of expression? It's not cynical. It's quite factual. Um, and there is lots of hope for freedom of, of expression in the United States and, and elsewhere. But the press has failed the American public in several important matters in recent years, which have been very costly to the American public. Could you, would you connect that, the same topic to WikiLeaks at all, you mentioned that? No, it really doesn't have to do with WikiLeaks. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of, of public issues, public matters, public affairs that were um, badly handled by our government, uh, and I think in retrospect uh, not well handled by the press, which failed to call the government to account or, or in some cases to call Wall Street to account. Too many big things happened that were proved to be terribly, disastrously costly to the American public without the American press uh, sensing the gravity of what was going on and uh, alerting the public to the possibility of, of serious damage. Do you think that serious damage is everlasting or it can be revived at all? Well, we're, uh, we're burdened now by uh, billions of dollars, literally, of costs uh, that have been caused by three dramatic failures of our government and, and the press in the 1980s, the 1990s, and in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, I hope we can do better in the future, but our record is bad so far in those major respects. Um, so last year you released a book called The Supreme Court and the Press, The Indispensable Conflict. Could you briefly elaborate on what this indispensable conflict exactly constitutes for us? Well, uh, both our Supreme Court and uh, the press, the freedom of the press, are constitutional issues. I mean, they are constitutionally guaranteed. And there's a tension between them from time to time as to <coughs> how thoroughly and how um, well, the, the press is able to cover the court. The court has never been fully cooperative or, or assisting to the press over the years. They've gradually relaxed restrictions, but here they are, a public body with great public visibility, great public impact, great public import at all times. And for instance, right now, they refuse to allow television coverage uh, of their proceedings. Uh, most of our state Supreme Courts allow television coverage, but our Supreme Court says um, it's too dangerous or it's too chancy, and uh, they, they say, they think, they allege that the um, televising would uh, demean the proceedings and the dignity of the court. It's just not true. Do you think you could um, maybe predict more effects that modern technologies are going to have on the relationship between court and press? I, I don't think I can predict it, uh, but the, um, uh, the court controls very carefully how much information about its own work is released, and they've always been that way. Sometimes they haven't released anything. Uh, they've left journalists to scramble. Um, they've gotten better over time, uh, but they still just say, it's up to us. We'll let you know how much you can tell the public, which I think is a, is a terrible, indefensible position. Thank you. I'm going to pass you to my colleague Ariane now. Can you explain why this con conflict is indispensable? Because um, the, the Constitution says there will be a Supreme Court that will be the last word and interpretation of our Constitution and of our laws. At the same time, they guarantee that the press is free. And the press, um, taking the side of the public, representing the public, if you will, wants to know, has every right to know, what's going on at the court, including coverage of the oral arguments, which are very instructive and very educational and very informative and very newsworthy. Um, and just because the, the history has always been that the court has held back and reserved the, uh, the flow of information from its own doings, as important as they are, they've told the press and the public, we'll let you know 
how much you're going to be able to know about what we do. But you, of course, you have to obey our orders. That's cynical. You covered the Supreme Court for a while for the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. and so I'd like to ask some questions about mm -hmm. the Supreme Court. While covering the Supreme Court, did you ever witness any decisions that were partisan? That is, that the court failed to look at cases of law and they were more based on interests. I don't think so. I mean, I covered the court a long time ago in the 60s. It didn't have the, this terrible ideological polarization that we have now. It was known under Chief Justice Earl Warren, it was known as a liberal court. It, it interpreted the, the freedom guaranteed in the Constitution broadly, including the, the, uh, the rights and freedoms of individuals accused of crime. And some people felt that was a liberal court. But in my mind, they were making the, the Bill of Rights part of our Constitution active. They made it, they brought it to life uh, for the first time because the Supreme Court had refused to enforce those individual rights in the past. So it was an exciting time, it was an historic time, and to me what the court was doing was right, including giving a, a very strong guarantee of freedom of the press for the first time. So what do you think has changed between then and now other than the composition of the court? Well that's what's changed is the composition of the court and, and uh, we've had um, several court appointees whose um, background was was what we call very conservative uh, in the degree of uh, freedom and in, in, in the uh, degree to which the rights guaranteed by our Constitution are are applied and, and uh, given to the people for the people's protection. This court is not very strong in protecting the rights of individuals. Typically when a corporation or the government goes up in a, in against an individual, the corporation or the government or the prosecutor wins. That's just been the history of this court. And uh, it's a very different time, and it's clearly the result of these appointments of, of uh, judges. They were all former judges, at least for a time. Uh, and they made a record of that kind of ruling. And the presidents who appointed them to the Supreme Court like those rulings. And that's what we're getting now, and we will, I'm afraid, for a long time. So do you think it's the problem that the president nominates the uh, Supreme Court judges? I mean, I thought they mm -hmm. have to be approved by Congress. They have to be confirmed by the Senate. But the U.S. Senate ha does take a vote on confirmation. And those have become very lively and newsworthy events. Uh, um, they don't, I don't think they influence the judges, the appointees' opinions or views of the law or his subsequent performance uh, on the bench. Um, but I, I, I don't know of a better system. It's a, I think it's a good system, but clearly it has been um, used in a, in a very distinctly political way in recent years. Okay. Following the Supreme Court's ruling in the Citizens United versus the FTC that money counts as freedom of speech and expression and the subsequent rise of super PACs, in a quote by Melanie Sloan, Director of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, she stated that we are moving to an age where we won't have the senator from Arkansas or the congressman from North Carolina, but the senator from Walmart and the congressman from Bank of America. Uh, given that, what is the role of super PACs in American politics and journalism today? Well, th that is the role, and, and uh, the Supreme Court says uh, they like that. They, they want corporations and unions and very rich people to, to uh, to be as involved as they want to be, which means not only just talking, but for the most part it means giving money. And they've uh, eliminated the restrictions on those gifts. And, and they're secret. We don't know who is giving money. Um, and that's um, a travesty, I think. Um, and it certainly opens us up to, to, to being bought by major financial interests. There's just no question about it. Does, doesn't this seem rather ironic that this ruling came at a time of a uh, economic crisis in the U.S. during a time when po people are getting poorer and poorer and the difference between rich and poor is getting greater. I mean, how does that destabilize the cohesion of the United States? I don't know that you can relate the one to the other. They, they've happened simultaneously, you're right. Uh, and um, they um, are both unfortunate developments in my view, but I don't see them as being connected or related except to the extent that uh, that the, the governors and the members of Congress that may be elected with these huge, and president who may be elected with the help of these huge unlimited corporations would then be, uh, take a very conservative view of the government's obligations to its own media citizens. That, that could be an indirect result. <coughs> what dangers do you think this poses for democracy? 
Well, it's a serious danger. I don't think there's any doubt about it. At least we can debate about it. There are lots of different views being expressed, but uh, and it's important for the press, to, I think, to keep to keep these issues alive. But in terms of the law, the, uh, with the Supreme Court being the last word, there's just no question that, um, as you suggested earlier, that the, uh, that the impact of this court uh, with this current makeup is going to be with us for a, a long time. And it's changing public life in America. Okay. The 11th Amendment to the Constitution deals with state sovereign immunity, which forbid federal courts from hearing cases that commenced or prosecuted against a state by citizens of another state or by citizens or subject by any foreign state. Do you think this should be altered in cases of war crimes or genocide? No, I, I don't. Um, and, and, and when we talk about states, we're talking about mainly states within the United States there. I, I don't think that's a problem or a barrier to, to, to justice. Do you think it's rather unfortunate that the U.S. has assigned the treaty to, along with the International Criminal mm -hmm. Court, doesn't that suppose its problems when it deals with other states or when it's trying to talk about human rights? Yes. So. <laughs> it is a problem. <laughs> so, can you elaborate a little bit more on it? Well, we should be on the side of, of fairness and justice, uh, and we should say so publicly. We should be a leader. The United States is known, historically uh, anyway, uh, for being a fair and just nation. And uh, we should be a, a leader in the battle for human rights in, in all respects around the world at all times. And, and we've, we've fallen short of that ideal. Okay. According to a book by Hugo de Berg, Investigative Journalism, Context and Practice, Internet, um, investigative journalism walks a tightrope through the conflicting demands and priorities. Closed, it closes journalists to get, uh, close journalists get to powerful individuals or groups the more these problems become exasperated. So I guess my question is, how does elite deviance play into this role when deciding court cases or even in journalism? You know, I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you restate well, for, it, please? I guess I'm referring to elite deviance, like white collar crimes. When journalists, journalists try to get close to a problem, but they're powerful or the group is very powerful, has a lot of money, how does that show inequality between, for example, when journalists try to report grassroots compared to those uh, bad events that are happening? Well, I gave an example in my talk, uh, a very fortunate and happy example of journalists uh, digging into the uh, uh, accounting and the public uh, records, uh, financial reports of a, of a big, powerful company called Enron, uh, which is a marketer of energy. Uh, they were re really an oil company, but they dominated for a time marketing. Of, of energy of all kinds in the United States. And um, they built up a big reputation and a big following uh, falsely and fraudulently. Uh, in, in many ways, they were false. And journalists from the Wall Street Journal dug into this relentlessly, hired some forensic accounting help uh, because the figures that the company was, was publishing were so difficult to, to understand and, and, to, and to pierce and to, and to uh, question. But they did, and they prevailed, and it destroyed Enron. Senior executives were, were convicted and sent to jail, and it even destroyed the accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, one of our finest, biggest, most reputable accounting firms, because they had um, rubber-stamped and approved these, these false and fraudulent uh, financial reports. So that's a, a very happy example for the good guys. That's good. Yeah. So, do you have any questions, Betty? No. Okay. No. okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, Thank you're you welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good to talk to you.